The moment I stepped onto the sprawling grounds of my great-uncle's estate, a chill ran through me. Not from the crisp autumn air, but from the sheer isolation of the place. Nestled deep within dense woods, the mansion stood as a lonely sentinel, its towering silhouette that seemed to whisper secrets of a forgotten past. My great-uncle, a reclusive and somewhat eccentric dollmaker, had lived and died here, leaving the property to me by some twist of familial fate. As I pushed open the heavy front door, the air inside smelled of dust and disuse, the kind of stagnation that speaks to years without a living soul to stir its corners. The main hall was lined with portraits, their eyes seeming to follow my every step. It was in the deeper rooms of the house that I found them, dozens of dolls, arranged with painstaking care on shelves and in display cases. Each was beautifully crafted, with faces so lifelike and expressions so detailed, they seemed on the verge of speaking. The dolls weren't just masterpieces of artistry, they were unnervingly real. A room further into the mansion held a wall covered in photographs, pictures of children, each frozen in time. My stomach turned as I realized the dolls bore a disturbing resemblance to these children. The eyes that seemed to follow me around the room weren't just in the paintings anymore. They were in the glassy gazes of these dolls, each one silently telling a story I wasn't sure I wanted to hear. This was my initial encounter with my great uncle's legacy, a legacy that felt as eerie as the shadows lengthening outside as the sun began to set. As the days lengthened into my first week at the estate, my curiosity drove me deeper into the heart of my great uncle's world. Within the musty corners of his study, I uncovered stacks of old personal diaries and scattered police reports. The writings revealed more than just the ramblings of a solitary doll maker. They hinted at something darker. The police reports were inquiries into several children who had mysteriously disappeared over the years, cases that grew cold and were eventually forgotten by everyone but those who had lost. Venturing into town, I hoped to gather more than just supplies. The locals, however, were not as welcoming as I had hoped. Their eyes were cautious, their words measured. In the town's quaint diner, overheard conversations paused as I approached, resuming only when I'd passed. It was Mrs. Eldridge, the owner of the diner, who, after some hesitation, finally spoke to me. Your great uncle was a strange man, she said, pouring coffee with a trembling hand. People here, they wondered about him, about those dolls and the children who vanished. Her voice dropped to a whisper. Some say he took those kids, made them into those dolls of his. The weight of her words hung heavy in the air as I walked back to the mansion, the echoes of the past whispering with each step. Determined to uncover the truth, I returned to the doll workshop, a room I had avoided since my first unsettling discovery. It was there, behind a false wall I accidentally discovered, when a misplaced doll fell and tapped against it hollowly, that I found the hidden door. With a mix of dread and resolve, I pushed the door open, revealing a narrow staircase spiraling down into darkness. At the bottom, I found a secret chamber, meticulously organized and preserved. The air was cool and still, as if sealed away from the world above. Along the walls were shelves filled with personal items, small shoes, worn toys, hair ribbons frayed with age. Each item was tagged and cataloged with obsessive precision. Photographs of children, the same ones from the wall upstairs, were pinned next to detailed records and beside each, a corresponding doll. My hands trembled as I realized the extent of what I was seeing. This secret room was a shrine, a morbid memorial to each missing child. The dolls weren't just figures of art. They were effigies, capturing the essence of children who had once laughed, played, and then vanished. The realization that my great uncle might have been involved in something so heinous was overwhelming. I needed answers, and I knew they were hidden here, within these walls and the cryptic writings he left behind. My resolve hardened. I would uncover the truth, no matter how dark it might be. In the eerie silence of the secret chamber, I pored over the meticulous records my great uncle had left behind. Each entry was a biography of a lost child, detailing not just their life and sudden disappearance, 
but also the precise manner in which their doll was crafted. The dolls, I realized with a chilling clarity, were more than mere memorials. They were vessels, capturing the essence of each child in haunting detail. My hands shook as I read, the dolls' glassy eyes watching me from their perches. As I dived deeper into my great-uncle's diaries, a narrative began to unfold, one that painted a picture of a man torn between genius and madness. He wrote of the world's cruelty, of children lost to neglect and abuse, and of his mission to save them. In their new form they are loved and cherished forever, he penned in a shaky scrawl. Here, they are safe, forever children in a sanctuary of their own. His words twisted a knife of doubt in my mind. Was he a protector warped by his own grief, or a predator cloaked in delusional benevolence? My days were consumed by the investigation, each discovery dragging me further away from the world outside. Nights were spent wandering the halls of the mansion, where whispers of the past seemed to echo through the air, a constant reminder of the legacy I now shouldered. The local community, already distant, grew openly hostile. Whispers turned to wary glances, then to outright avoidance. The old grocer, Mr. Hawkins, his voice trembling with suspicion, finally voiced the village's fears one morning. Your uncle was no saint, and now strange things happen since you've come back. Just what are you up to in that old house of yours? The tension in town escalated when a local child went missing. A young boy who had wandered too close to my estate, they said. The timing was disastrous. As search parties formed and police inquiries began, the pointed fingers turned my way. The situation forced me to a decision point. Could I continue this solitary investigation with the town against me? Or should I reveal all and seek help? Choosing transparency, I invited the sheriff and a small group of locals to view the secret chamber, to see the truth of my great-uncle's obsession. Their horror mirrored my own as they took in the rows of dolls, the wall of photographs, and the detailed logs of each child's life and transformation. He thought he was saving them, I explained, my voice hollow. He believed the world had abandoned these children, and this was his way of keeping them safe. Forever. The revelation did not bring the understanding I had hoped for. Instead, it sowed deeper seeds of fear and mistrust. As I stood before the community, their faces a mix of horror, sorrow, and suspicion, I realized that my quest for answers had only deepened the shadows cast by my family's legacy. Yet, amidst the chaos, an unexpected ally emerged. Ms. Eldridge, the diner owner, whose own sister had vanished years ago. Let's find the truth once and for all, she whispered to me, her eyes resolute. Together we resolved to dig deeper, to unravel the full story behind each doll. Perhaps in doing so, we could restore the missing pieces of the town's heart, pieces that had been lost to fear and time. I knew that each step would take us closer to either redemption or damnation, and I prayed silently that we were ready for either. As the autumn leaves began their descent, signaling the end of one season and the start of another. I sat in the dim light of the workshop, the final diary of my great-uncle open before me. His words were etched with a frantic urgency, a stark contrast to the precise, meticulous entries of his earlier journals. This was his confession, a raw outpouring of a troubled mind. My creations are not mere playthings, he wrote, his handwriting deteriorating into an almost illegible scrawl. They are protection for souls too pure for this cruel world. I have seen the forgotten tears of children, heard the silent screams of despair. They come to me, lost and forsaken, and I do what I must to protect them. It was a chilling admission of his life's work, abducting children he viewed as neglected or endangered, then preserving their likenesses in his dolls. He saw himself not as a kidnapper, but as a guardian angel, rescuing them from a world that in his eyes, had failed them. I sat back, the weight of his words pressing down on me. The line between madness and benevolence had blurred into obscurity in his mind. My resolve hardened in that moment, knowing what I had to do. His actions, though perhaps well-intentioned, had caused irreparable harm. Families were torn apart, lives shattered by his misguided crusade. The truth needed to come out. I picked up the phone dialing the number for the local police. 
My voice was steady as I reported my findings, requesting an official investigation into the children linked to the dolls found in the chamber. I outlined everything. The secret room, the detailed records, and the diary entries that confessed the harrowing truth. The police were quiet on the other end, absorbing the gravity of the revelations, before promising to send detectives to the estate. The decision to go public was not taken lightly. I knew that revealing this would forever alter the legacy of my family. The name that I carried would be marred by scandal and horror. Yet, as I prepared to face the inevitable public scrutiny and backlash, a sense of duty fortified me. This was about justice for those children and their families, about bringing peace to souls that had been restless for far too long. As I waited for the police to arrive, I walked through the rows of glassy-eyed dolls, each a monument to a lost child. The workshop, once a place of eerie stillness, now felt like a chamber of echoes, the whispered goodbyes of children who could finally hope for closure. This was the end of one chapter, and the painful beginning of another, where truth, no matter how dark, would shine a light on the past. When the police arrived at the estate, they conducted a methodical and comprehensive investigation. The records I had uncovered in the secret chamber proved crucial, allowing them to confirm the identities of several missing children. As the scope of the tragedy unfolded, the local community's initial suspicion melted into a somber understanding. Neighbors and townsfolk, once wary and distant, began to offer their assistance, participating in the investigation and providing any information that could shed more light on the decades-long mystery. As I watched the police carry away the dolls, each a silent sentinel of a child's stolen innocence, a profound sadness enveloped me. The weight of my family's legacy pressed heavily upon my shoulders. Reflecting on the complex tapestry of my great-uncle's actions, his misguided attempt to protect and preserve the essence of these children, I resolved to transform this place of sorrow into one of remembrance. The mansion, with its dark secrets now exposed, would become a memorial museum dedicated to the lost children. My hope was that it would serve as both a sanctuary for their memories and a cautionary tale about the intricate and often perilous nature of human intentions. This place, marked by both pain and care, would stand as a testament to the enduring impact of our choices and the possibility of redemption through truth.